The COVID-19 pandemic showed us how a microscopic virus could upend our lives. There is so much out there that we need to understand. But for every threat, there are heroes working at the edges of science and policy to protect us. I'm Dr. Abdul El Sayed, former Detroit Health Director and host of Crooked Media's America Dissected. Every episode, I talk to the doctors, scientists, culture makers, and policy leaders who are working out new ways to protect us against our biggest threats. New episodes of America Dissected every Tuesday. Listen on Odyssey, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. America has got a $500 billion healthcare problem that few people have ever heard of. Nearly half of the 12 million people who are covered by both Medicare and Medicaid report they are not in good health. It's an inefficient, ineffective system, and it's caught the attention of lawmakers like Republican Senator Bill Cassidy from Louisiana. If you can come up with a set of solutions that stakeholders agree to that can save the taxpayer money, and make a patient's life better? I mean, by golly, you found a sweet spot. Today, inside the search for that sweet spot, what that could mean for patients, and why it's left many advocates, experts, and industry insiders skeptical. From the studio at the Leonard Davis Institute at the University of Pennsylvania, I'm Dan Gorenstein. This is Tradeoffs. A bipartisan group of senators are expected to introduce a bill today, March 14th, aiming to help people trapped in a special kind of health insurance hell. People often forced to carry two insurance cards, use two sets of benefits, decipher two sets of rules. They're known as the duels or duly eligible. And despite the U.S. spending half a trillion dollars a year, we have little to show for it. Before we dive into the details of the measure, we're bringing in senior producer Leslie Walker to put the legislation into some context. Leslie, you've been reporting on this for a few months now. Let's start with who are the duels? Sure. So like you said at the top of the show, Dan, these are folks who are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. There's about 12 million of them, and they're almost all living on less than $20,000 a year. But in a lot of other ways, they're pretty different from each other. More than a third are under 65 and have a disability. About half are people of color. A quarter speak a language other than English at home. And these folks also have a wide range of health and social needs, mental illness, chronic diseases, poverty, hunger. And you're telling us, Leslie, that to get all of those various needs met, these folks have to navigate two exceedingly complex insurance programs. That is correct. They generally go to Medicare for the urgent medical stuff, doctor's visits, surgeries, and Medicaid for longer term needs, like let's say help at home or maybe a long stay in a nursing facility. And one big reason Congress is concerned is that all that care is costing nearly 40000 bucks a person on average. And that is all coming out of taxpayer-funded programs. Exactly. And the thing is, despite all that money, a third of duels still end up in the ER at least once a year, often for avoidable reasons. And Leslie, do we know why we're spending so much money? I mean, obviously, these people face a bunch of serious health conditions. Is there more to it than that? The health conditions are a huge part of it, for sure, Dan. But you've also got a maze of completely kind of crazy conflicting rules and incentives between Medicare and Medicaid. And that creates this game of hot potato. You mean basically each insurer is trying to like pass the patient off? Yeah. I mean, we've forced these two insurance programs to cover one patient. And when you do that, you see each side trying to push costs onto the other. And that's a recipe for a bunch of bad, wasteful care that burns money and often harms patients, like a woman that I interviewed last year. I'm Salima. I'm 33. I live in the Bronx. We actually profiled Salima Render Hornsby on the show last September, so you might remember her. I do, indeed. I remember well. Right. So she has spina bifida, a condition that limits her use of her legs. So she needs a wheelchair to get to the store, to the doctor, hang with friends. For years, she'd counted on this clunky chair. She called it the Cadillac, until one summer day she was heading to this appointment. The chair stopped in the middle of the road. Salima was completely stranded, terrified. I could not move. 
and there was nobody to um, help me. So she starts the process of requesting a new chair. This is early 2022. And a few months later, a letter arrives from Medicare. Request denied. I can't understand why you would deny me my way I get around. You're denying me my legs. But she needs the wheelchair, Leslie. She does. But under Medicare's rules, they only cover chairs for inside the home. Medicaid covers chairs outside the home. Well, then why didn't she just go to Medicaid first? Here's where that game of hot potato comes in, Dan. Medicaid says they'll only cover the chair if Salima tries Medicare first, even though there's like zero chance in hell Medicare is going to cover it. Okay, so this is totally maddening for the patient. It is. And that was just the beginning of this maze for Salima. Her Medicaid plan kept jerking her around. And all this waiting, it took a toll on Salima and her family. Her mom forked over a thousand bucks to buy this temporary backup chair, but it didn't fit great. The padding was flimsy. So Salima got pressure sores, backaches, nerve pain, and she ended up leaving the house less, all just because she was stuck jumping through these health insurance hoops. In all, Dan, it took 20 months, a full year and a half for Salima to get her new chair. Okay, so Salima's story is infuriating, nonsensical, it's certainly inefficient. But I know it's not new, Leslie. These programs have been around for decades. But with the introduction of this bipartisan bill, it now seems like some senators have a new appetite for tackling the problem. What's changed? I'd say two big developments are driving it. First, Just like you, Dan, America's aging fast. Whoa, come on, Walker. That's me. (laughs) Sorry, I had to. But more than 80 million people are going to be on Medicare by 2030. A fifth will probably also be eligible for Medicaid. So in other words, this $500 billion problem is about to balloon? Big time. And the second major change here, Dan, is that lawmakers, they actually now have some data about how to tackle this problem. Casey Schwartz with the advocacy group, the Medicare Rights Center, told me people had long assumed that putting a single insurance plan in charge here would be the solution. And now that's been tried at scale. The past 10 years has been a time of a million different projects called duels (laughs) Um, and, and a lot of different ideas. We've seen this explosion of new kinds of insurance plans promising duels, at least on paper, more seamless, more coordinated care. Almost 6 million people are now covered by one of them. Some pioneered by state Medicaid agencies, spurred on by the Affordable Care Act. Others, known as dual eligible special needs plans, or DSNPs, are run by private insurers. Pouncing on a business opportunity here, huh? Definitely. And in all, more than 20 states have gotten in on this experimentation. And every major insurer has two, United, Humana, Aetna, you name it. But this period of rapid growth has now kind of reached an inflection point. Many of those state-run experiments were temporary and are sunsetting in 2025. And the private market for duels? Cue the food fight music here, Dan. It's become a free-for-all with nearly 900 different insurance plans, aggressive marketing, and some questionable quality, raising alarm among watchdogs. And all of that, Dan, leads us to one simple question. The question is, where do we go now? University of Pennsylvania economist Eric Roberts told me choosing a path forward is going to be tough. This new bipartisan bill takes its best crack at answering what's next, but a lot of people are less than impressed. It's not particularly provocative or novel. We feel like it's got a long way to go. There's just nothing new there. The forecast on this legislation, Dan? strong headwinds. Okay, we batten down the hatches and lean into those headwinds after the break. Introducing Wondersuite from Bluehost.com. Website creation is hard. 
But now with Bluehost, you can answer a few simple questions about your business and get a unique WordPress website or store right away. From there, you can customize your design, colors, and content. And Bluehost automatically helps you get found in search engines like Google and Bing. From step-by-step guidance to suggested plugins, Bluehost makes WordPress wonderful for everyone. Go to bluehost.com slash wondersuite. I'm Shankar Vedantam, here to tell you about a great mystery. That mystery is you. As the host of a podcast called Hidden Brain, I explore big questions about what it means to be human. Questions like, where do our emotions come from? Why do so many of us feel overwhelmed by modern life? How can we better understand the people around us? Discover your hidden brain. Find us wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. So, Leslie, before the break, you were telling us about this bipartisan bill that's expected out later today in the U.S. Senate, and it's been met with mixed, even some harsh reviews from experts, industry groups, and consumer advocates. Before we get into why, let's first just talk about the bill itself. What is the big thing it does? So it puts in place this mandate, a requirement that all 50 states offer duels at least one super seamless insurance plan from a menu approved by federal officials. One plan, one insurance card, one place to go for all of your needs and questions. That sounds like a dream for duels. It does. I mean, for some folks, this would be their first time ever getting this kind of help. And even for folks already enrolled in those private plans just for duels, the special needs plans. Oh, oh, the D snips? D, yes. <laughs> this bill <laughs> would offer those people an option that's like those plans on steroids with insurers doing a whole lot more work. Wow. So this bill actually sounds like a meaningful upgrade. It may be, but a lot of people worry it won't be. Thus the harsh reviews, I guess. Exactly. Experts like Penn researcher Eric Roberts told me that figuring out how to make these two crazy complicated federal programs work like one well-oiled machine for a super diverse population is really damn hard. It's like building high-speed rail, in my idea. It's like it doesn't happen overnight with one piece of legislation. It happens through years of practice and implementation. And this bill, Dan, puts a lot of that hard work on the shoulders of states. The states that did try building these super seamless plans over the past decade really struggled. Eric told me most failed to save money or keep people out of the hospital. I see. So now I guess I'm getting a sense why the bill authors are giving states a menu of options rather than like pushing one specific plan, something that could leave people like Salima high and dry. Right. Leave that menu open. Then, Dan, there's this other mammoth problem and the bill barely touches it. We're adding one more thing to an already confusing landscape of choice for dual eligible people. That's Allison Reiser with the consulting group ATI Advisory. She says the insurance market for duels is a complete mess. I mean, Allison told me some people have literally a hundred different plans to pick from. That includes both plans tailored just for them, but also regular Medicare plans that offer no coordination at all. And these are often very sick people with low incomes, many who do not speak English, trying to sort through all of that. Right. And at the same time, private insurers and brokers are peppering these people with deceptive marketing. I mean, one survey of older duels found that nearly a third had seen something in a Medicare ad that they later found out wasn't true. So does this bill do anything to help people shop for more seamless plans? Well, it does propose automatically enrolling people. But when states have tried that over the last decade, a lot of folks end up opting out. And just out of curiosity, why is that? Some people are just confused by how these new plans work, worried whether their doctors will still be in network. Advocates also told me people tend to be skeptical of anything that limits their choices, even with good intentions. Overall, Allison Reiser's message to Congress is either narrow the options for consumers and insurers here, or at least make the right choice a whole lot more attractive. If we're going to build an integrated program, it has to be the easy choice for dual eligible people, for health plans, for states, for providers. We cannot create a two-tier system where it continues to be easier to enroll in or offer non-integrated options. 
Okay, let's take a breath. This is what you've told me about the bill so far, Leslie. This bill would require states to offer duels at least one truly seamless plan, but doesn't spell out which plan. Part of that is because based on data, no one plan definitively improves care and saves money. Right. Then you've got this wild west of a market, tons of confusing choices with some insurers advertising one thing but delivering something else. And the one move to clean that up is a provision that didn't work well at the state level. That about sums it up, Dan. It's tough sledding here. And really, Allison Reiser says it's up to Congress to reckon with this bill's limitations. Do you want to go big or do you settle for something that's going to kick the can another 10 to 15 years down the road? And she sees the bill, as written at least, as more like a kick of the can. Yeah, if nothing changes. And that would mean some pretty sick people and their families will keep paying a high price. I talked to Hong Trung, a friend of mine, last fall. Her mom is a dual and is in bad shape. In the last year, she'd been to the ER maybe about 10 times now. Now, I know we talked at the top of the show about Salima and Medicare and Medicaid playing hot potato with her wheelchair, but most duels, Dan, need a lot more care than Salima. Two-thirds have at least three chronic conditions and half struggle with basic stuff like showering. So last August, here was the scene. Hong's mom, Hu Lam, is in kidney failure, can't move her head, can't eat solid food, and the family is just feeling ghosted by health insurers at nearly every turn. I don't know, it's a lot, a lot of emotion, frustration. And this is like what's broken with healthcare. It started a few years back with simple stuff, like her Medicaid plan sending this terrible taxi service to pick her up for dialysis. They never showed up on time, uh, wouldn't come to the door, and then the taxi company would also just not pick her up and say, oh, well, we only cover one ride a day. I'm like, how could that make sense? Hong says the insurer did nothing to improve the service, so she had to step in, use her own time and money to orchestrate Lyft drivers to ferry her mom around San Jose. Then whose health got worse. She needed more aids at home. But a state policy lets the insurer off the hook on that and forces the duel to figure it out. So Hong and her brother ended up having to take shifts while they scrambled to find aides who could speak Chinese or Vietnamese. I can't interview them, and I don't know how to contact them on my own. Hong speaks neither language, so she had to rely on her relatives as recruiters. And it was the same disappearing act when Hong tried to get her mom into a nursing home. She says ultimately, the family just felt abandoned by the people who were supposed to be helping. It's just so frustrating when you're just like, this all fucking sucks. Like, someone just needs to manage all of this. And I, it's just so frustrating. That's a bleak picture, Leslie, of what kicking the can, basically maintaining the status quo, can look like for people. It's making me think about that quote from Allison Reiser, do you want to go big? What tweaks do you think it might take for this bill to really help a family like Hong's? There are a few big ones, Dan. One, the bill would have to make it much harder for people to end up in the kind of bad, uncoordinated plan that Hu Lam was enrolled in. So weed out some of the other options. Got it. Two, these new seamless plans would need some serious oversight from states and the feds. Otherwise, insurers might cut corners, maybe hook a family up with a shoddy taxi service and call that care coordination. And three, Congress and states have got to make more high quality services available. Because what good is a super seamless plan if your local nursing home has a four year wait? Totally. So the bill is scheduled to get introduced today. Any chance we see some of those tweaks as it works its way through Congress? Hard to know. But for context, I mean, most of my sources don't expect the bill to pass this year. That includes Senator Cassidy himself. He told me the conversation around this bill is about helping people, as he puts it, get comfortable. I'm now familiar with the issue of duels. I know what a duel is, and I know they have terrible outcomes and they cost us lots of money. Oh my gosh, we should do something about it. The senator said he's optimistic. Lawmakers can bring this over the finish line by next Congress. The one definitive thing I can say here, Dan, is a lot more people in Washington now know about this $500 billion problem. 
On top of this bill, Democratic Senator Bob Casey introduced his own last week. The Biden administration is taking some baby steps to clean up that crazy market, and some states are pushing ahead on their own, including California, where Hu Lam now has a more seamless plan. And this all may lead to progress, but as you laid out, Leslie, it's probably going to take a long time to make care better for people like Hu Lam and Salima Render Hornsby. I think that's right. Leslie Walker, thanks so much. Thanks, Dan. Senate aides tell us they expect a hearing on the issue facing duly eligible Americans later this year. No date has been set. I'm Dan Gorenstein. This is Trade Offs. Doctors, hospitals, and insurance companies are making it hard for some of the nation's most complicated patients to thrive. People with intellectual disabilities live full human lives and need to be treated, respected, the same way that we do every other patient who's 55 years old and shows up at the doctor. And we are a long way from that. And yet, one doctor has forged a better path for people with Down syndrome and autism who historically were locked away. People still today believe that there are some people who need to be in institutions because their needs are too great. That's just not true. The doctor on a quest to improve health care for people with disabilities. Next time on Tradeoffs. Thanks for listening to Tradeoffs. If you've just discovered us, remember to subscribe to the feed so you never miss an episode. Subscribing is free and easy on whichever podcasting app you use, the NPR app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever. The Tradeoffs team is producers Ryan Levy and Alex Olgan, editors Kate Cahan and Deborah Franklin, executive director Jessica Silverman, marketing director Catherine Dougal, audience engagement lead Shannon Crane with help from Kate Seepy, Kelly Osmondson and Cedric Wilson, sound designer Andrew Perella, executive editor Dan Gorenstein and senior producer Leslie Walker. This episode was edited by Zach Tracer. The Tradeoffs theme song was composed by Ty Sitterman, with additional music this episode from Blue Dot Sessions and Epidemic Sound. Tradeoffs' coverage of complex care is supported in part by Arnold Ventures. Additional thanks to Caroline Broder, Alice Burns, Mike Cheek, Amber Christ, Jose Figueroa, Jenny fugleston Nabenik, Lisa Haratunian, and Jill Sumner. Thanks to all our listeners who helped to support our work, including Lincoln Weed, Stacey Dusitsina, and Hannah Nieprash. Our media partner is Side Effects Public Media, based at WFYI. Tradeoffs is supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Arnold Ventures, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, the Sozose Foundation, Just Trust, West Health, the California Healthcare Foundation, the Leonard Davis Institute at the University of Pennsylvania, and the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation. Our financial supporters are not involved in any decisions about our journalism. The views expressed in this episode are those of the individuals and not those of trade off staff, advisors, or funders. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Hi, I'm Una Chaplin, and I'm the host of a new podcast called Hollywood Exiles. It tells the story of how my grandfather, Charlie Chaplin, and many others were caught up in a campaign to root out communism in Hollywood. It's a story of glamour and scandal and political intrigue and a battle for the soul of a nation. Hollywood Exiles from CBC Podcasts and the BBC World Service. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. Acast helps creators launch, grow, and monetize their podcasts everywhere. Acast.com.